Hey, Outliers. Welcome to another episode of Outlier Academy, a show about the misfits, rebels, and idealists shaping our world and the ideas, influences, and lessons that propelled them to the top of their craft. I'm Daniel Scrivener, and on the show today, we go on a trip with Jack Swain of Mindbloom as we explore the world of psychedelic therapy. In this episode, you'll learn why psychedelics have emerged as one of the best ways to treat anxiety and depression, how a forgotten body of research from the 1950s and 60s led to the emergence of psychedelics today, how Mindbloom scaled from a single clinical office in 2019 to a nationwide telemedicine practice through the pandemic, We talk through an average patient's journey from working with a clinician to their guide to journaling to tripping at home. And we talk through why psychedelics are so effective at treating conditions ranging from generalized anxiety and depression to PTSD. I found this interview fascinating. And if you're interested, it's the perfect gateway to explore the world of psychedelics, which now includes many publicly traded companies, including a Thai Life Sciences, Compass, and even Field Trip, which has locations you can visit in New York and Canada. To learn more about Mindbloom, visit mindbloom.com. You can find our show notes with our favorite quotes, links, and clips from this episode at outlieracademy.com slash 42. For more from us, please follow us on Twitter at Outlier Academy and subscribe to our new YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Outlier Academy. There, we post some of our favorite two to three minute clips from the latest episode every week. So if you subscribe, you can get notified when those new videos drop. And with that, let's jump in with Jack Swain of Mindbloom. Jack Swain, welcome to Outlier Academy. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So preparing for this interview has been one of the most fun times I've had preparing for any interview in my memory, because this is a really deep topic. And what we're going to talk about today is a specific company that you work for called Mindbloom, but kind of zooming way out, it's about a new space that is emerging that I think is super interesting. I also don't know a ton about it, so I'm excited to dig in with you, which is psychedelic therapy. And I thought to start, if you could just describe Mindbloom, its mission, and your role at the company. Yeah, Mindbloom is a mental health and well-being platform that provides at-home clinician-prescribed psychedelic therapy for people with anxiety and depression. Our six-session ketamine therapy program combines software, content, medication, and five-plus hours of guiding clinician support to deliver far better outcomes and experiences than traditional mental health care treatments at costs a fraction of what other ketamine providers are charging. It's incredible. And we're going to dig into all that because there's a lot to dig into there. Just to kind of set up your own experience, your own background, what was your path to mind bloom? I know you've been in the medical space for a while. So maybe compare and contrast kind of that experience and the culture at mind bloom. And then I'm also curious, just the significance that psychedelic therapy has had in your life. Prior to Mindbloom, I worked at a healthcare consulting company called The Chartist Group and had really cool experiences working for the leading health systems in our country, like Cleveland Clinic and Michigan Medicine, helping with projects like adopting value-based care, mergers and acquisitions, payer provider partnerships, so really got to see our healthcare system from the top level and see how the most well-funded, sophisticated healthcare institutions really struggle to provide high-quality, affordable community health. I thought I would be there for a long time, but Mindbloom kind of popped up back in early 2019. I've always thought that my path would lead towards mental health specifically because I come from a family where that's always been really top of mind. Like my mom struggled with depression. My dad has been an alcoholic for most of his life. He's now 10 years sober. I'm so proud of him, but- amazing. It's been a journey. I'm no stranger to anxiety. So I've seen how 12-step programs, antidepressants, therapy just don't get so many people where they need to go. Psychedelic medicine is a whole different thing. I've had profound transformative experiences with psychedelics in the past. And so I knew anecdotally how powerful these therapies could be. And then there's been this resurgence in research in the past 10 to 20 years, kind of reproving a lot of the things that we saw back in the mid 20th century before a lot of research was shut down kind of around the time of the Vietnam War. So all of this led to one of my lifelong closest friends is our CEO, Dylan Bynan. And he approached me. He was looking for a healthcare consultant, coincidentally, to help launch this psychedelic therapy company that he wanted to start called Mindbloom. And my personal experience, interest in mental health care, the research, and Dylan is 
the smartest person I've ever met, even before Mindbloom, even before I was saying this on podcasts, like I would tell people, Dylan is the most impressive, smartest person I know. So being able to combine that and go work for someone who's, this is his third startup. He's had two successful runs in the past. And so it was just a total dream job to be on the front lines as our head of clinical operations, working directly with Dylan and our science director, Casey Palios, to launch Mindbloom back in 2019. Yeah, it's incredible. I want to ask one question based off that experience you had directly before Mindbloom of kind of doing this broad consulting with a lot of the top operations throughout the United States. I guess my sense would be that generally people are pretty bearish on medicine and the medical system in the U.S. And so I'm curious for your take on what gave you hope while you were there and what is improving or exciting about where medicine is heading. And then what did you walk away with also a sense that things were broken? And can you share a little bit of context of kind of like what that looked like and felt like as you were trying to work in that system? I feel like everybody in that system knows the system is broken and you have a lot of people with the best intentions and who are just hyper talented trying to solve these massive problems in our healthcare system. Like our healthcare costs are 17% of GDP, way higher than any other country. And our outcomes are nowhere near commensurate with the amount that we spend. And that's kind of systemic, just kind of the way our system has evolved with this third party payer landscape. And so what gave me hope is that so many really smart, well-intentioned people are working so hard to solve the problems in our healthcare system. And there is progress. So the company I worked for, Chartist, was everybody there was very mission-driven. And so that's what's been really cool going from Chartist to Mindbloom. It's just been surrounded by people who really drink the Kool-Aid of what we're doing and are so mission-focused. And so there is innovation in the healthcare space. There's a move towards value-based care. So our healthcare system traditionally has been fee-for-service, where you give a doctor money, they provide a service. It doesn't matter if you get better, and that helps to drive up costs and not really increase a lot of accountability. There's this move to value. We don't give government credit for innovation, but CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, often lead the way in payer reimbursement innovation with value-based care, like bundled payments. So there is progress. And I got to work on a cool value-based care project at Cleveland Clinic in my last couple of years at Chartis. So there is hope. So it's clearly broken and there's so much room for innovation, specifically in the mental health care space, where if you look at surgery, you might now be operated on by a robot, which is incredible. If you look at mental health care, we're still using a lot of the same tools in therapy and antidepressants that we've used for decades it's broken, but there's definitely hope. And the research around psychedelics is just unreal. Like the potential of these medicines to completely transform the way that we provide mental health care and help people who really need big changes in their life is really exciting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's exciting to me too, as well, too, that it just feels like in the last few years, I think this was definitely accelerated by COVID-19 in some ways, but that mental health is now a topic that a lot of people are a lot more open about. Only in the last few years have I had discussions with some of my friends about dealing with depression, them dealing with depression, my bouts with depression. It seems like just culturally as well, too, things are evolving. Is that your sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think we're going to look back 10, 20 years from now and think it's crazy that we didn't treat mental health just like physical health. Like when you think about people started to exercise for health in like the mid 20th century, that really took off in like the 80s. And thinking about I think for so many of us, not exercising now is just crazy. And so the fact that we're not treating our brains like we're treating our bodies, I think we're just going to feel really dumb when we look back and or like, why weren't we more open and taking time and carving out time in the day to really focus on something that's so clearly important to our happiness and effectiveness in life? We're going to spend a lot of this episode talking about mind bloom, but something that's definitely become clear to me, the more I've talked with you, the more research I've done is I think everyone could use a bit of foundation just to help get people from zero to one in terms of the space in general. And so I wanted to start with just, you touched on it a little bit in some of the notes you made earlier, but I'd love to just stop for a second and just define what psychedelic therapy is. And then we can compare and contrast that, but maybe just start with what is it and why is it a novel or different or interesting way? Traditional healthcare or traditional mental health is it's this more paternalistic model where you go to a doctor, you explain the issues you're having, they give you a pill, or they're kind of helping you work through your problems in therapy, and then you kind of go off and hope you get better. With psychedelic medicine, 
you're a very active participant in the treatment. And so psychedelic therapy starts with preparation. So setting intentions and really thinking about what you want to get out of treatment, having this psychedelic experience, which is both often profound and perspective shifting, but also has these great benefits to your brain of increasing BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, which increases neuroplasticity. So increases your brain's ability to form and repair neurons, and also decreases function in your default mode network, which is kind of involved in kind of like your day-to-day automatic processing. And so when you have these negative thought patterns, decreasing activity in your default mode network helps you break free of those negative thought patterns and start to develop new positive thought patterns. And so you have this experience. And then after, integration is crucial to psychedelic therapy. So how do you take this experience you had and then turn it into lasting change? And so that's reflection, journaling, working with a coach or a therapist, a lot of ways that you can really start to reinforce these perspective changes and positive feedback loops that you're developing in your brain so that you can have lasting transformation and behavior change. So it sounds like, and maybe just to try to repeat that back, if the old system is just trying to give you something, typically a compound you're going to take (laughs) that just tries to treat the symptoms, one, you're actively engaging in this. Two, it seems to be very holistic and that it involves a lot of different things. And three, obviously, just from what you said there, everyone that's getting treatment puts a lot more effort, energy, intention into it. Yeah, that's fair. To stop for a second, too, and address maybe the cynics point of view, you know, I'm sure some people would maybe look at it and say, oh, well, you're just going and you're just maybe tripping on a drug. And I think it would be helpful for a second to talk about why taking a psychedelic is so important. And just a couple things that in my own kind of research that have come up over the last few years is, and I would try to dig this up and put this in the show notes because it's a little fuzzy in my memory now, but maybe a year ago, I listened to a really great podcast with someone talking about why psychedelics are important and their kind of reason was it has a lot to do with de-patterning where it's the first time you can kind of disassociate and you can actually maybe look at your life truly objectively. And he gave a bunch of examples about how this is found all over the place in nature from dolphins playing with puffer fish to (laughs) literally get a high and to disassociate. In this interview, he's talking about just all of what's going on in your brain. So I don't know if you can build on that, but like talk about why the psychedelic part of that experience is so important and what people are really getting from that. Yeah, I think you started to summarize it well. So it is that breaking free of those old patterns and putting your brain in this really fertile neuroplastic state. And so that's just even with something like their IV ketamine clinics, for instance, that are still often using a very medical model where you're not focusing as much on the intention and integration, but still getting the medicine. And it's still wildly effective, like 60 to 70% response rates compared to like 40% for antidepressants. But then when you're coupling it with, so there are these pharmacological benefits of the medicine on its own. And then when you take kind of that subjective experience and couple it with intention setting and integration, you're really amplifying the ability of your fertile brain to make long lasting changes. And so without that, both perspective shifting experience and just putting your brain in a great place to change are both really important to the process. Yeah. Maybe another way of saying it, it's just super blunt is if you want to change some of your patterns, you kind of have to disassociate, break those patterns, and then use some sort of a a state change, I guess, to reinforce new patterns. So just at a high level, it seems to make a lot of sense. And I think it's right now as a society, there's a stigma around altered states. I think that's changing. And there's been so much research and positive news coverage, which is really helping to break that stigma. But for so many people who've heard drugs are bad their whole life, they look at a quote unquote trip. And it's hard to see that as something that's therapeutic and not like hedonistic or recreational. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I think it would be interesting to talk about for a second you guys are clearly focused on anxiety and depression. And I'd love for you to maybe talk about that a little bit and why those two areas. But the other question that I had is, are there other areas that psychedelic therapy is good for? And why aren't those part of the model now? But maybe just talk about what can it treat and why are you focused on anxiety and depression? We started with anxiety and depression because there's one, just such an epidemic of anxiety and depression, hurting people's both happiness and ability to be productive and achieve what they want to in life. And then second, there's the strongest clinical literature right now 
for ketamine around depression and anxiety. And so we chose those two to start because we are starting an innovative company and there are plenty of others before us who have kind of treaded the path for us to follow in treating these indications with ketamine and other psychedelics. So that's where we started. But the ability of psychedelics to treat a broad spectrum of indications is pretty remarkable. Like there are studies that show ketamine and other psychedelics are effective for treating PTSD, OCD, substance use disorder, alcohol use disorder. Those are certainly indications that we plan to start to treat in the near future at Mindbloom as well. It's interesting. And I know today you guys are focused on ketamine and a big part of that is that it's legal. Yeah, huge part. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's obviously would be important in medical practice. But I know kind of as you look down the road, there's things like MDNA and psilocybin or magic mushrooms. Maybe just talk about that, how those other two things are progressing and when people might see those things be options that they have in getting treatment. Yeah, Our science director, Casey Palios, who's just his work with psychedelics in a therapeutic context at MAPS and NYU is remarkable. He's a principal investigator in the MAPS phase three MDMA for PTSD clinical trials. And so it looks like those are one to two years away from FDA approval, psilocybin, hopefully not too far after. And the work at MAPS showing the efficacy of MDMA for treating PTSD is just crazy effective, really going to make a lot of positive change for a lot of people who are struggling with PTSD. And researchers at like Johns Hopkins and Imperial College of London and other places have done really great work with psilocybin and have shown really, really high percentages of people in those studies are seeing strong improvements in depression symptoms. And the durability is also remarkable. Like some people report symptom relief for six months. There's also something like, I forget how high the percentage is, but a really high percentage of people report it as one of the top five most powerful experiences of their life. And so you have both the subjective and the clinical data to show the promise of these medicines. And so it's really exciting to see that we'll have, hopefully, in addition to ketamine, these other compounds in our toolkit in the not so distant future. Yeah, it's amazing just to see the kind of progress in the space and acceptance of it. I'm just curious for your thoughts on why do you feel like psychedelic therapy, people seeking treatment for things like anxiety and depression... And the success you're seeing at Mindbloom, is there anything in your mind that makes it clear why we're seeing all of those things kind of converge now? Is there a cultural element? Is that kind of a medical element? Just talk about kind of the setup and why we're seeing this resurgence in just the last couple of years. And it seems like as we look forward, it's just going to continue to accelerate. I think there's a confluence of factors. There's just the mental health epidemic that's becoming more and more clear. Something like over half of the population will have mental health indication in the course of their life. Something like 60% will never get treatment, most because of cost. So you have this problem that's becoming harder and harder to ignore. COVID has certainly brought that to the forefront even more so. And then you have this resurgence of research in psychedelics that institutions like Johns Hopkins have done such a great job of kind of paving the way to show in a really clinically sound manner and maps as well, just that This isn't something that we think is true. This is something that we now have strong clinical data to show is true. There's also been great news coverage of psychedelics. There's the book, How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan that so many people cite as kind of their education on the history and current state of psychedelics and their like true medical potential. So I think you have all of these different factors that are helping to reduce the stigma and lead people to want to try these as legitimate mental health treatments. And you even have institutions like the FDA that are giving breakthrough or fast track designations. So they're saying, we want to make it easier to move these through the clinical trial process as fast as we can to get them FDA approved because they show such promise clinically. And they've given these designations to psilocybin, MDMA, and ketamine. That's amazing. I want to ask one more question before we dive into kind of more in the weeds around Mindbloom in particular and the model that you guys have. And that is, I know obviously confidentiality is incredibly important, so I'm not asking for any kind of personal story, but I was wondering if you could kind of generalize a little bit and just help people understand what a traditional success story looks like. And 
if they're different enough, we could talk about one for anxiety versus one for depression. What are people seeing and what are you seeing as a company that is just so impactful about the way this treatment is impacting people's lives? Let me start generally and then get specific. So in general, 88% of our clients report clinically significant improvements in depression symptoms after four sessions, 77% report clinically significant improvements in anxiety after four sessions. So the broad data, and we've been collecting outcomes data on our clients from day one, just shows how effective this is at a high level. When we dig more into how does this present in specific clients, we see clients often come to MindBloom because they need relief from depression or anxiety. And then once we're able to address just kind of this pain that they're feeling, then it kind of like opens them up to focus on other things like relationships, their jobs, just so many things that have been not top of mind because they've been riddled with this pain related to anxiety or depression. So we see that we're able to kind of free people to focus on things that are so important to themselves, their families, society. In terms of specific stories, we have incredible clients who are open to being champions publicly for Mindbloom, which is great. And so there have been pieces in like Bustle and Women's Health, ones coming out in Oprah Magazine. In Women's Health, for example, it is a story of one of our clients who had tried just you know a grab bag of different antidepressants over decades and hadn't been depression-free as long as she could remember. And then after her first ketamine therapy session, that started to clear. And so she started to feel symptom free again and just has this remarkable story of her family members are noticing that she's just this like buoyant, different person that they haven't seen in so long. And so when you see how this is just making transformative changes for people, it's so inspiring. And that's something that is so fun about working at Mindbloom is you get to see that on a daily, weekly basis, you have people who are just able to achieve so much in such a short period of time, which is unfortunately pretty rare in traditional mental health. That's an incredible story that you shared. I imagine being someone or a friend in that woman's life and how incredible it would be to see this person that you maybe thought was gone come back and how impactful that would be. And it's also interesting, even just using that word relief, that's a really heavy word. Anytime someone says they need relief from something, it's clear that that is more than just an annoyance. <laughs> it's something that is kind of being, it feels like it's pressing down on them. Yeah. And for anyone who's, I mean, I can speak from personal experience, from anyone who's experienced acute anxiety or depression, you know, like you're not yourself. You're not able to work at your normal level. You're not keeping up with the people that you love in your life. And so that's, there's so many manifestations that are just can be so crippling to achieving your true potential. And so being able to exactly give relief and kind of free people to focus on the things that really matter is truly fulfilling. Yeah, it's huge. So I want to transition now and really focus on MindBloom's model. And something that was fascinating to me when we were talking before, as we were kind of preparing for this interview, is you talked about that the model started out as patients just seeing a clinician. And then you guys had this insight that a clinician paired with a guide, and we'll talk about what a guide is, is a really powerful concept. Maybe talk about that model and why you made that change and just how important it is and how stark of a difference that is from other treatments people might have. We started as a clinic in New York. So we started with an in-person and telemedicine model and had a single clinician, our first clinician, Kristen Arden, who's amazing. And it's really helped build our program to where they are today, was personally treating our first cohort of 200 clients. And so that was great. But as we think about trying to create this model that's not only going to increase experience and outcomes, but also reduce cost, we want to think of, hey, how can we give more hands-on time to clients to really help amplify the results and hold their hand is through this kind of new, different process of psychedelic medicine, which as we've talked about is quite a bit different and can feel like overwhelming or confusing to someone who's not familiar at first. So we introduced our guide program. And so we have coaches and people who are really passionate about psychedelic integration who are our client's primary point of contact. And so our clients are paired with a guide immediately when they sign up for MindBloom. And that person really shepherds them through their program. So they'll help with preparation, 
be there on video with them before and after their first session, support their integration throughout their program, and also serve as the liaison between the client and the clinician, which is great for both the clients because they can text their guide anytime. And also for our clinicians who love having essentially direct access to their clients so that they can get updates on how they're doing, check in. And it's something that as a clinician, you don't necessarily have the ability to in a more traditional mental health environment. So it's this great dyad of the clinician and guide who are working really collaboratively to help our clients get the most out of their treatment. And our clinicians and guides spend collectively over five hours on each client who goes through MindBloom. That's incredible. What is the kind of typical background look like for a guide? You talked about coaching. I love to maybe go a little bit deeper there. Like, what does that look like? What have they been maybe certified in? And then as well, I'm just curious for maybe more of the personal side, like, is it important when you're hiring these people that they've had a personal experience with anxiety or depression? Is it more that this is just an important area of their life? Like, how does that factor in? The number one criteria that we hire for is people who are mission obsessed, who truly believe that this is something that could transform mental health care. We think that if you don't truly believe that that's true, it's going to be challenging to provide these transformative experiences for our clients. In terms of what the typical guide looks like, it's, there's, I mean, of course, the normal answer, there's no typical and there's a range of different backgrounds that we hire. But if I had to say the most typical is somebody who has a coaching certification, there's a lot of like really great coach training programs out there and has experience coaching clients, either for a company or for their own practice. And it's also really knowledgeable about psychedelic integration. So we provide a lot of onboarding and training when somebody joins the MindBloom team, but we want people who are educating themselves and really knowledgeable about how to best support these experiences when they join the team. And we've been just blown away at the number of people who are really excited about working in this field. And there haven't been a lot of opportunities before MindBloom. And so we've just been blown away by the caliber of people who are really excited to work in this space and have just been waiting for it to emerge as a career opportunity. Yeah, I'm sure as a coach, the coaches that I know, they're just obsessed about people and having an impact on someone's life. And I know that oftentimes just coaching kind of outside of the context of something as profound as psychedelic therapy, maybe doesn't feel as profound. It doesn't feel like you have that impact. So I imagine that being able to join MindBloom and truly feel like each person you work with, you've been able to have a profound impact on. It's just really powerful. Definitely. One thing I was curious is just, and this is a bit of a kind of brainstorm thought experiment, but I was curious to try to like extrapolate out the fact that you guys have clinicians and guides and that you have a process that someone is really working with effectively a coach that's helping them set intentions, kind of integrate that into their lives. That seems really profound in medicine, and I haven't heard of that before. And I immediately think of, like, why doesn't this exist in treatment for diabetes? Why doesn't this exist in treatment for obesity? It seems like in so many other areas, pairing up someone who is kind of hard-focused on the medical side and someone that's focused on the kind of software in your brain, <laughs> emotions, who you are side is really powerful. Is that true? Do you think there's opportunities for this model to make its way into other areas of medicine? Yeah, it is. There are a lot of companies that have really grown recently. Like if you look at Noom, they're doing health coaching, predominantly weight loss coaching, and they just had a huge IPO and they have a few thousand coaches. And then there are other evolving like healthcare startups as well that are really relying on coaches to help clients get the most out of treatment. So I think we are seeing it emerge more and more, and it's just such an important component of yeah, so many of these clinical models where you're trying to increase client experience and bring down costs and working with a psychiatrist is really powerful, but it's also really expensive. And so if you can pair somebody who's still able to help create really powerful outcomes through whatever it is, whether it's psychedelic integration or is supporting you through your weight loss journey, I think we're going to see more and more of this in the next few years. It seems like an incredible way to drive impactful outcomes. We've talked about this a little bit and what a patient's kind of journey looks like from initial consultation through treatment. But I want to ask one question around that, which is for anyone listening that has struggled with anxiety or depression before or is struggling with anxiety or depression now, 
Something I'm interested in is just what the bar is for treatment. And we talked about this a little when we were kind of preparing for this. And I'd love it if you could maybe just set up what that is. So people, one, if it affects them, they have an idea of kind of how that might play into what they're experiencing, but also just so everyone knows generally that like there is a bar for being treated and what that bar is. Yeah, of course. So we are a medical company. So we treat people who have a diagnosis of anxiety or depression. And I think because of the stigma around mental health, there's this kind of view that if you're not like cripplingly anxious or depressed, that you don't qualify for a diagnosis of anxiety or depression. But if you're like stuck in bed, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can't get up. <laughs> yeah. Which again, is this just stigma that we need to break? Because if you have, like, for example, symptoms of anxiety could be just overly focused on your worries, stress, these things that I think we all go through at times that prevent us from functioning at our highest level. And so many of us are now working on through like meditation, through mindfulness, exercise, whatever it is you do to like help you cope. I know I personally had kind of confused standard workplace stress with what I now know is a diagnosable level of anxiety. And so we treat clients with mild, moderate, or severe anxiety or depression. And we provide a initial assessment on our website. So you can take a quick four question questionnaire to see if it's something that could potentially be a fit. And I think for a lot of people who think that you need this crippling level of anxiety or depression to be eligible for treatment, that's certainly not the case. There's a lot of in between that our clinicians have seen really great success with ketamine therapy when working with our clients. I want to talk about, and this is switching over to pretty tactical, but I want to talk a little bit about the mechanics of scaling something like MindBloom. And you talked about at the beginning, you guys started out as an in-person clinic, obviously much harder to scale, <laughs> easier to scale if you're doing something like telemedicine. But I had a couple questions around that. I know when we talked last, you guys were around 20 clinicians and 40 guides, which my sense is that's pretty significant scale, especially the number of patients you can treat with that. But how does scaling work? And I guess some of the questions I wanted to ask there, and these may be completely dumb questions, but that's <laughs> part of my job is... No such thing. So things like, are there regulatory issues in terms of rolling this out? Is any of this still state by state, different regulatory environments and kind of legal environments? Like, Just talk a little bit about what the journey has been like scaling, what it's like scaling a telemedicine practice, and any of the kind of weird mechanics around legal regulatory issues people might not know. I could talk for the rest of this podcast and several more <laughs> about the regulatory considerations of expanding a telemedicine practice. I'll spare your They're listeners. They're considerable, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> but yeah, there are states. Each state has their own regulations around telemedicine, telemedicine prescribing, scope of practice for providers. So these are all things that we have to navigate. And fortunately, we're not the first who's had to navigate it. So we are able to learn from other companies who have like paved the way. And of course, we spend lavishly on telemedicine attorneys and have a great general counsel to help us navigate this as well. So a lot of that, once you kind of tackle that, the scaling is, I think what's really been exciting and perhaps surprising to us is how much our clinicians love this work because I think it's a dirty secret in psychiatry that things don't work very well. <laughs> like the traditional medications don't work very well. And with antidepressants, it's 40-40. There's 40% chance that an antidepressant is going to work and 40% chance that you're going to have side effects. Terrible. <laughs> and it takes four to six weeks to figure out if an antidepressant is working. So as a clinician, like it can be a slog to work with someone over a long period of time and tweak medication to find something that works. And when it does, it's amazing. And our clinicians like love working in mental health for that reason. They're able to see real progress in their clients over time. And Mind Bloom, our clinicians and our guides are seeing progress at the end of the first session at times. For some people, it might take a few sessions to start to see benefit, but still you're working on a timeline of days or weeks as opposed to months. And the percentage of our clients who are having positive experiences in clinical benefit, as we talked before, is 88% of our clients see improvement in depression. And like our NPS is 70, which is crazy high for healthcare. So our clients are also having really great experiences. And so that creates a really 
great positive environment for our guides and clinicians. So scaling telemedicine is kind of, as you referenced before, great because you don't need a physical practice. So what we can do is hire clinicians, hook them up to our platform once they're trained in our protocols and in our tools, and that opens up their schedule for clients to schedule with them. So we can really rapidly add coaches and clinicians to our platform. And then of course we navigate the state-by-state regulatory environments as we go, but it does make it possible to scale very quickly. And so we're of course, priority number one is safety. So scaling at a rate that we can maintain quality and safety for our clients. But even since we last spoke, we're now up to 30 clinicians and 50 guides. So it's now that we've proven that the model works and we can scale it safely while maintaining these incredible client outcomes, it's we want to help as many people as we can and get this to people across the country. We're in 12 states and serving 50% of the population right now. And we expect to be available to 75% of the population by the end of the year. I mean, those are just staggeringly impressive stats in terms of penetration with how early you guys are and just the impact that you're able to have. It's amazing too. You said you're at 30 clinicians and 50 guides now. It's a yes. significant bump even from when we last talked. So it's clearly scaling. I want to ask one question. This may be a little bit esoteric, but we've talked a couple times about telemedicine. And I thought it would be interesting just to explore that for a little bit. And I'm hoping maybe some of your consulting background has given you a little bit more color on telemedicine. But what I wanted to ask there is, Similar to kind of psychedelic therapy, that's something that I've heard of. I assume other people have heard of. People have probably even maybe had a telemedicine experience. But actually, I haven't had a telemedicine experience. I don't know many people that have. And oh, I didn't really even hear that word. What a shame. <laughs> I know. And I didn't even hear that word until really kind of 2020, which I heard that first from some of our doctors. We've got a couple of kids and I was like, let's do a at-home appointment over a video call. So I'm curious... How long has telemedicine been a thing? And I guess you talked about telemedicine attorneys. I imagine that 2020, us all being stuck at home, helped move telemedicine forward. Do you see real momentum behind that now? And you think that's going to be a force that's going to have a really big impact in years to come? Absolutely. Which probably is no surprise, my answer, since I work for a telemedicine company. But (laughs) I've started my consulting career in 2010 at Accenture. And we had this perk where we could use Teladoc, which was one of the early telemedicine companies. I didn't know it was even around in 2010. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, And nobody used it, like except me. I was like the one person in my hotel room, like trying to figure out how to use Teladoc to see if I could figure out like why I had this crazy cough while I was on the road. But yeah, it didn't pick up. And even when I was in business school, I was on a team for an entrepreneurship project and we explored like launching a telemedicine company coincidentally and so we did like the things you do to create like your minimum viable product and surveyed our friends and family to see if this was something they'd be into and they were like no zero percent response <laughs> yeah <laughs> why wouldn't i just google it or go see a doctor like why do i need telemedicine and so we were like okay i guess this idea is busted but that was a while ago and now with covid it has I mean, of course, just really, really pushed people towards telemedicine. And I have a former coworker who now works for a data company in healthcare and was saying that something like low single digit percents of consults were telemedicine prior to COVID. And then it shot up to like 50, maybe 50 plus percent were telemedicine during the peak of COVID. And that's come down, but not nearly to where it was before. So I think now that so many patients now see the benefits of telemedicine and how many things you don't actually need to be seen in person by a doctor in order to get like a really reliable clinical decision. And we've seen like providers, it's great to be a provider if you can have treatment by telemedicine because it gives you so much more flexibility instead of being tied to an office. And when you think about we're so much more germ conscious now. So going to a doctor's office is it can be like filthy. Like you're going around where a bunch of sick people have already been to go see if you're sick. And if you weren't, maybe you will be when you leave. (laughs) And like the number of hospital acquired infections is alarming. And so when you can kind of stay in the comfort of your own home and protect yourself from germs, it just, it seems like a no brainer. And I'm so glad that 
one of the silver linings of this horrible pandemic has been an accelerated adoption of telemedicine, which has certainly been powerful for MindBloom and our clients as well. Yeah, it's fascinating. Just to pull on a couple threads there, you talked about, and I just want to underscore it because I think it's really interesting, that obviously if the medical system is broken, if things need to be reinvented, similar to technology, we need a bunch of things that bring down the barriers to invention and innovation and disruption coming in. And a big one of those is reducing cost. And so something like telemedicine obviously allows a company like MindBloom to start and scale with much less capital. But the other piece, and this is one I really want to talk a little bit about, is there are also, and I haven't heard anybody really have this conversation, there are also a lot of ways in which telemedicine can be profoundly better than going to the doctor's office. And one, which obviously makes a ton of sense in the context of MindBloom, is you don't have to go have a potentially weird uncomfortable experience in someone else's environment that's not yours, you can actually have that at home. And if you extrapolate that out, you can just be in a much more comfortable environment as you're having these consultations. At least speaking for myself, literally my least favorite place in the world is being in any sort of hospital. I just hate everything from the lighting to the way it feels like it's not a good place, at least not in kind of my experience. So maybe just talk a little bit about that and like the things in which people might not know or understand that telemedicine actually helps deliver a profoundly better experience. I actually like being in hospitals from my time at Chartist, but I'm probably weird. (laughs) I mean, a couple of other ways where I think telemedicine is so powerful is, and we talked about this in our prior conversation, but white coat syndrome, a lot of people see doctors and their blood pressure goes up because usually when you're interacting with a doctor, it means something's wrong. So that's certainly a benefit of telemedicine. Another is access. There's a shortage of mental health care professionals. So, I mean, so mental health, this is the access problem is even higher, but it spreads across many specialties within healthcare. But if you live in a rural area or someplace that's not close to a doctor's office or to a hospital, it's tough to get care. And so, you may, even if you want to get psychiatric treatment, you may not be able to if you have to drive an hour and a half each way, maybe they're not in your insurance plan, like who knows. And so when you have telemedicine, suddenly it allows anybody with an internet connection to get care. Yeah, it's profound. It obviously levels the playing field there in a pretty significant way. I want to now just get into the weeds a little bit, because when we were talking before, there was just some fascinating little things that popped up that I'd love to explore to kind of round up the conversation. And one of those was you shared that back in the 1960s, there was this wave of psychedelic therapy that was happening. And this was like really important research. You can still go back and read those studies and there are really profound effects, but things just kind of stopped and that never moved forward and that wasn't accepted. Talk a little bit about the history of psychedelic therapy and kind of what a shame it is that some of this has kind of been decades in the making. Michael Pollan talks a lot about this and how to change your mind, how there's No other example of research with as much promise as psychedelic medicine showed in the mid-20th century being just wiped away. That was for cultural, political reasons. And we've been kind of in this decades dead zone of advancement in psychedelic research. And the cost to our society is so high when you consider that suicide is a top 10 leading cause of death. You have 50,000 deaths a year due to suicide and how much more lost happiness, productivity, because people just aren't able to function at their peak, either at their job, with their family, for themselves. There's just so much lost potential by shutting down research in this space. And so it's really, really sad. And so the resurgence of this research and ability for us to show with like brain scans what's happening again with like BDNF and your default mode network and kind of these like leading evidence-backed hypotheses for why psychedelics are creating such transformational mental health outcomes is really exciting. And so I think we're back on the right path. It looks like the FDA is on board. Great institutions like MAPS, Johns Hopkins are really leading the charge. And we're really excited to play our role in the clinical delivery of these medications by increasing affordability, access, and approachability to psychedelic treatments. That's the second time you've mentioned Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind. And I'm guessing it might not be the last, but I wanted to ask one question around that, which is, so clearly, if anyone is interested in psychedelic therapy, 
they should go read this book. And it sounds like it's a fantastic kind of primer on the history of it. It's great. Especially if you like Michael Pollan as an author, which I mean, who doesn't? I know. I feel like I need to do more research and I definitely need to read the book because I haven't gone down that particular rabbit hole. I'm curious. So obviously the note is kind of, if this is interesting to you, you should absolutely go and read that book. What are some of the surprising things, most interesting things that you came across in that book that still stick with you? Some of the research in that book and there's the Psychedelics Explorers Guide gets into some of the research as well. But there's just this like broad swath of research, not just for mental health indications, but also like people using psychedelics to solve problems that they were stumped on at work. And so you had these like scientists and engineers and people who have, have these really heady jobs who were able to just make progress after taking a psychedelic. And I think that's counterintuitive. You think that you're going to have this trip that kind of distorts your ability to think clearly. Sure. And of course, it wasn't at the peak of a psychedelic experience, but the ability for psychedelics to increase creativity and its effects on like neuroplasticity and your ability to, as you mentioned before, like break old thought patterns and think in new creative ways was just so cool. And so we're still confined as a society to using these chemicals uh, medically. Some states are moving towards making them more broadly available. We have this kind of risk mitigation, often what feels like at all costs, the cultural stance on chemicals that induce altered states. And so hopefully sometime in the future, there will be the ability for people to use these chemicals for personal growth and for creativity and solving sticky work problems in addition to treating diagnoses for mental health conditions, assuming that the safety profile continues to look like it does today. We're able to educate people on how to use them safely and in the right container. That was one of the coolest lessons of the book. Another is that the default mode network effects of psychedelics are similar to what you see in really experienced meditators. So it's just kind of turning off that part of your brain that's involved in like normal day-to-day -day processing and these thought patterns. There's another great book called Stealing Fire. Great book. Yeah, yeah, great. That talks about how entrepreneurs and extreme athletes have been able to use psychedelics to access flow states and enhance creativity. There's a lot of really cool applications of these medicines in addition to mental health. It'll be really exciting to see how hopefully the stigma continues to fade and we're able to move in a responsible but progressive direction towards getting the most out of these really remarkable chemicals. I, for one, am extremely bullish on that long term. I don't know anyone that's tried psychedelics that's had a life-wrecking experience. I know many people that have had a life-wrecking experience with alcohol and other substances that are freely available. That touches close to home for sure. Yeah, I hope that logic wins out at some point. I want to ask about one more thing, which is we talked a lot about neuroplasticity. And one of the things I know that's an important part of the process that clients go through is journaling. So they're journaling as they're coming out of that experience. They're journaling in the days afterwards. And I want to focus on that for a second, because I'm sure everyone at this point has listened to some interview where someone's talked about the importance of journaling in their own life or something they do in the morning. That's often just to kind of regurgitate these thoughts, just kind of dump what's in your brain, get it out on paper and or be able to kind of use that as kind of a something like therapy where you can kind of talk to yourself, have a conversation with yourself, make some observations while you're journaling. Why is journaling an important part of your process? And what do you think is happening when someone is doing that journaling that's really helping this kind of lock into place? We have a great blog on our site on the benefits of journaling and kind of some of the science behind journaling and how it applies to psychedelic therapy. So for any interested, check it out. That we'll link blog to that. does a much better job than I'm about to do. <laughs> but with a ketamine therapy treatment, a lot of our clients, I'm a Mind Bloom client myself, so I've had this experience you have all of these thoughts that come up during your session. And it, it's almost like a dream where you wake up from a dream and oftentimes you don't remember your dream or if you don't write it down right away, it's really fleeting. And so journaling is important just to get those thoughts and insights down on paper. And then there's also kind of, as you mentioned, 
this process of consolidating your thoughts and really by writing them down on paper, you're starting this process of taking advantage of that neuroplastic state to turn a fleeting thought into something that you can look back on, remember is true, and can really create change. Because there's, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to mention Michael Pollan's book again, just because he summarizes so much of this so do well. It. But when you hear something like, love is beautiful, you know it's true, but you don't really feel it. I mean, at certain times you do, but during a psychedelic experience, you may have these profound thoughts of something that seemed obvious. Like now I really feel and believe to be true. Like the most important thing in my life is my relationship with my partner or something. And so when you write that down and then you look back at it and you remember how profoundly that thought impacted you during that session, it can bring you back and kind of reinforce how important that is. So again, it's all this whole therapeutic process around taking what could be a fleeting experience and turning it into thought or behavior change. It's fascinating. I want to ask one more question. Could totally be a shot in the dark, but we've covered a lot of ground. So we've set kind of the foundation of what psychedelic therapy is, drugs that are used, who it can kind of treat effectively, how that treatment works. Talked about MindBloom, the model you guys have, pairing clinicians with guides, this kind of telemedicine approach. Is there anything that you feel like we haven't covered that this interview just wouldn't be complete if we didn't touch on it? One thing that I think is important is that I'm, as our head of clinical operations at MindBloom, really excited about is the research we're doing. And so we have, from day one, we've collected all of this really valuable outcomes data from our clients. So, And that's been part of our strategy was from the beginning is we know this is true from the clinical data, but now we want to prove that it's true so that we can really demonstrate that this is a safe and effective treatment as we scale. And so we have baseline, mid, and end of program data from our clients. And we're launching what I believe will be the largest study of psychedelics, of psychedelic medicine ever in the second half of this year. And so we're really excited to write this up and contribute to the body of knowledge in the field so that we can continue to see the field move more towards using these treatments that we believe provide just a 10x better experience and better outcomes than traditional treatments. Yeah, that's an incredible point. And it's amazing. I had a conversation a couple of months ago with Josh, one of the founders of Levels, which is Constant yeah, Glucose Monitoring. Great interview. Yeah, which is another friend. But one thing that's profound, just the connection between Levels and MindBloom is it's so cool to me. I obviously am a huge believer in entrepreneurs building businesses and just the power of passionate people to kind of have an impact on the world. But it's amazing to me that Levels is set to have the largest basically constant glucose monitoring data set in the world. You guys now have this largest data set of psychedelic therapy outcomes in the world. It is so cool to start seeing that private businesses are actually doing leading research, pushing fields forward, and it's not just kind of contained in the research world or the medical world. It's so important to have the data behind these decisions that we're making. And I think that's what's really exciting to be doing this for a uh, company at scale is now we have access to all of this data that we can use to refine treatments over time, find the right treatment, or as we're able to use additional psychedelics down the road, like what's the right treatment for the right person at the right time and having the data to really back it up. And that's been hard to do in the past. And so using a scientific method approach to really find out how we can harness what we truly believe is the remarkable power of these medicines is really exciting. That's incredible. And for anyone that's interested, people can go and visit mindbloom.com. And you talked about a quiz at the beginning, I guess, just to reiterate for anyone listening that this seems interesting, where can they go? What should they do as a kind of next step? Go to the website, just right there on our homepage is get started. And we put a lot of time into developing helpful educational content for our clients. So you can learn a lot about psychedelic medicine in general, the mind bloom treatment model, how you work with your guide. So if you're curious, hopefully anything you'd want to know is there on the site and it's really easy to get started if you're interested in being a client. Jack, this has been a phenomenal interview. Thank you so much for your time. It's been so cool. Yeah. Thanks so much, Daniel. For links to everything Jack and I discussed, as well as our favorite quotes and clips from this episode, visit outlieracademy.com slash 42. 
Skip ahead to the next episode to learn about the habits, routines, tools, books, and influences that help propel Jack to the top of his field, including some of Jack's favorite books like No Rules Rules, Stealing Fire, and Psychedelic Explorer's Guide. To hear more incredible interviews with guests like Scott Belsky, Kevin Kelly, and the founders of companies like Titan, Rally, and Primal Kitchen, go to outlieracademy.com to explore every episode. There, you can also sign up for our free weekly newsletter, Outlier Debrief, where every Friday we share a few highlights from the latest episode, as well as our favorite articles, headlines, and moments each week. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you here next week on Outlier Academy.